Hello there folks, I'm the Blockbuster Beach Bum, analyzing the films you may or may not have seen on the big screen, and today I am beginning my multi-part retrospective on the Planet of the Apes franchise. Beginning in 1968 with the classic Charlton Heston film, continuing with the with the sequels released in 1970, 71, 72, and 73. Also with the Tim Burton remake in 2001, the reboot Rise of the Planet of the Apes, and Rise of the Planet of the Apes sequel Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, which I shall do a review of in about a month's time when the film is released in the United States. But for now, my thoughts on the first three Planet of the Apes shall be encapsulated in this video, and then the other two films in the classic Apes canon will be reviewed in a second video. So my story begins with Planet of the Apes, a 1968 classic science fiction film based off of Pierre Boulle's uh, science fiction novel, which is very different from the film in many ways. The novel actually is mo more modernized, like it's apes in a modern uh, civilization setting. Whereas in the film, it looks a bit more primitive in these triglodyte um, homes. And it looks a bit more ancient. Even though the apes are rather intelligent, at least by our standards. So, the film... What I really like about this film is that the first half hour, you don't see apes. First half hour is dedicated to our three astronaut characters, Taylor... Landon and Dodge. Taylor is played by, of course, the great Charlton Heston, and this is probably my favorite role of his. In the beginning, he's just such a cynical asshole, and as the kids say these days, he really doesn't give an F about anything. I mean, when uh, one of their uh, teammates is dead because they went into hypersleep, he goes, it's a bit late for a funeral, she's been dead for a year already. And yes, that's something I forgot to mention. The story of the Planet of the Apes goes like this. You have the crew um, from the 1970s. They fly, but they get lost, and they find themselves in the year 3,954 3, on a strange, uh, desolate world where apes are the dominant species, dominant intelligent species, rather, and humans are kind of uh, mute, and they take the place of what we would look upon as apes. We dissect them, or the apes dissect the humans, and conduct experiments and such. You have, in the first half hour, it's more atmospheric. Basically, the humans are exploring what the apes know as the Forbidden Zone. And then, at the half hour mark, we s they come to the revelation that the... Apes are the intelligent life forms and in a really nice hunt uh, scavenger type of scene where we see the apes on horseback, which to me is one of the most ominous and uh, classic icons in any movie. I mean, an ape on horseback. It's like seeing like a giant gorilla on the Empire State Building. It's such an iconic image that, you know, it's just you just look at it and say to yourself, that is just such a fascinating image. It just kind of sticks in your brain forever. So, a lot of the characters are rounded up, uh, two, one of them is dead, Taylor is, Taylor is captured, and Landon, uh, I don't want to talk about his fate because it's a bit depressing. But you have Heston's character is discovered by Zira, we're well, not discovered, but is, uh, exper is uh, studied by Zira, played by uh, Oscar winner Kim Hunter. And she is a really interesting character. She's a bright ape uh, chimpanzee scientist who really finds the humans fascinating and is probably more pro-human than any of the other apes in the movie. And then uh, her husband is Cornelius, who's played by Roddy McDowell and would, in some capacity or another, um, ex with the kind of uh, technical exception of the second movie, appear in all of the classic apes movies. Uh, Cornelius uh, is a cool character, but unfortunately, he doesn't he isn't doesn't look upon the humans the same way that Zero does. He kind of it's like he he wants to he's the guy that wants to play it safe. He doesn't want to say mm, I, I don't want to really touch upon anything, even though there's I understand what there's certain things that the ape culture does that are wrong. I want to protect my wife and myself. 
you know, that that's what his character is. And you really don't see his character really evolve or change too much until uh, Conquest of the Planet of the Apes. No, not Conquest. Um, Escape from the Planet of the Apes, which is the third film in the Apes series. I apologize for that mess up. And then you have the other really most important Apes character, one of my favorite antagonists in any science fiction film, um, the Maurice Evans character, Dr. Zaius, who's the orangutan a politician, the minister of science, and also is the protector of the faith in many ways. And you know he knows something. He's the guy that's, that's like trying to shut down any experiments that would prove that humans are intelligent, and he hates Taylor from the onset. He knows that Taylor is special, and he doesn't want any other apes to realize that. He wants to... He doesn't want the truth to get out. And that's a very interesting commentary with these apes movies, is that um, they're more... They really have to deal, deal with several issues. First, they have to deal with, like, you know, race issues, because the way certain ape hierarchies look at each other. The orangutans are at the top. They're, the like, the white politicians. Chimpanzees are the middle. They're, like, the scientists, the um, intellectuals. And the gorillas are the lowest part. They're the soldiers and menial workers. And even in one of the later films, Zira kind of detests the gorillas. She kind of is disgusted by them to a certain extent. So you can almost kind of see a sense of like prejudice or, or almost racism there. And uh, I always find that to be really fascinating with these apes films. That It's like Twilight Zone, which actually the screenplay was co-written by Rod Serling. That you can take these social and political issues but put them in another universe and you can still kind of get the same message while still getting an entertaining uh, science fiction premise. There are some really entertaining action scenes in the film, especially where, you know, the beginning with the hunt and Taylor trying to escape from the clutches of the apes, but which all culminates into the famous line, take your stinking paws off me, you damn dirty ape. Charlton Heston did that much better. But what else is fascinating about the film is almost a commentary on... Um, free speech as well, because the character of Taylor, Heston's character, is uh, being investigated into a trial, and they don't really let him speak, and they kind of say he doesn't have any rights. And this is a commentary sort of on the McCarthy trials, partly because um, the, uh, the other co-writer, um, the gentleman's name uh, escapes my mind, um, pardon me, that was Michael Wilson. Michael Wilson also co-wrote this screenplay, and because of the Hollywood blacklist, um, he really couldn't do much, and he actually wrote um, the screenplay for Bridge on the River Kwai, which won Best Screenplay, the Oscars, but it was not awarded to him. It was awarded to Pierre Boulle because of uh, the blacklist, and he wasn't awarded that Oscar until, like, the 80s, I think, which is really kind of depressing, and he wasn't, I don't think he was even alive to receive it, so, I mean, he got it, but not till the after he died. And you have, have, like, a lot of great lines. Human see, human do. You know, hum they, they could never imagine that humans were ever that intelligent. It, it's just... It's really fascinating. And also how they, when Taylor shaves at the end of the movie, they're like, it makes you look more primitive. <laughs> you know, and ironically, the apes all have, like, all this, like, crazy hair and or, like, beards on them. It's really uh, fascinating. Another character I'd like to mention is Nova, who's like the human female in the movie, and she's kind of more or less, she's not a very developed human character, saddened to say, uh, feminists might not like that very much, but she works more as a symbol in the film. She's the, she's a human, she's initially supposed to be paired up with Taylor to mate. Taylor initially kind of abandons her, he's trying to get the hell out of there, but when he, um, when they give him an opportunity to escape towards the end of the film, he brings uh, Nova with him. So it's kind of like him trying to recapture his humanity. And that's kind of what this movie is really partly about. Is Taylor trying to, you know, become human again. In this world where humans are, you know, dumb. Or they can't speak. And they're less evolved uh, than their ape kin. And then, of course, uh, there are problems in the movie. One of the, my main problem, The main problem in the movie is that the uh, when they came, come to the real revelation that there's a doll that speaks. And it's a human doll. like a doll that's like a human looking and you say um would an ape make a human doll that talks and i'm like problem with that is we have dolls that are animals that can talk too so 
I don't know. I get, it works kind of in the context of the film, but it also doesn't. Also, you have the famous ending of the film, which I forgot to say this early in the video. There will be spoilers across the world because these movies inevitably lead into each other, so spoilers are just going to happen anyway. The ending of the film is, of course, that Taylor discovers the Statue of Liberty on the beach, realizing that humanity did this to themselves, kind of hinting at that the hum humans... Um, in the wake of a human a, a um, nuclear holocaust destroyed themselves and uh, led the apes to you know dominating the earth in many ways so yeah that's really dark stuff and it kind of started this trend with the apes movies where they either had depressing or ambiguous endings and um, this is one of my favorite lines in movie history when Heston is looking at the Statue of Liberty and he's just like you maniacs you blow it up! God damn you! God damn you all to hell! I'm sorry, I get carried away. That's like one of my, probably like my, one of my favorite movie quotes ever. And whenever I get depressed or angered by something, I'll probably say that line. But aside from that, the first Apes movie is a classic. You have to watch it. And it boasts some really great performances. Let me tell you about the makeup. That I haven't even touched upon yet. Oh my god. The makeup. Uh, created by John Chambers. Also did the ears for Spock from Star Trek. Uh, this ape makeup really makes the, you know, human ape. Um, makes it like a humanized ape. Which is really fascinating. But the actor who really knows how to do this the best is Roddy McDowell. And he just knows how to do like all these facial tics. He kind of, he overacts. But he overacts because, you know, it helps um, the facial expressions come through more that way. And there's just tics that he has. There's like, you know, with his nose and his eyebrows, especially with the eyebrows, he's very expressive in the makeup. And I just want to put that as a side note. And John Chambers won an honorary Oscar for his makeup accomplishments for Planet of the Apes. Now we move on to the second film. The first film was, of course, a big hit. Uh, made a lot of money, of course, is a well-known film today, but we got a sequel in 1970, which takes place literally right after the events of the first film, because we have uh, Charlton Heston riding on horseback with Nova, uh, trying to discover the Forbidden Zone, and then suddenly he's captured by a mysterious force, and Nova's on her own at this point. And then we have another human uh, search team trying to look for Taylor and his crew, and this team uh, is, well, one of them dies, and then you have Brett, played by... James Franciscus, who kind of comes along, is like, wait a minute, and now he has to discover this is a planet of apes, and he's trying to find Taylor. Um, what is interesting about this movie? Well, what I do like is that they don't try to force Franciscus and Nova to be, like, love interests. I like that. I don't know. Something about, like, if they kind of forced him onto Nova, like, as a love interest, it just wouldn't have worked, in my opinion. It just would have felt like, ew. I mean, that's Heston's lady. That's Heston's lady friend. Um, you know, this movie, also, you kind of notice, like, the budget goes down for certain things. For example, the ape makeup, unless you're a major actor or a major character, it looks, it's just a mask. I could just go to, the, um, go to Party Fair right now and get a better mask than what they had in this movie. And this is what happens when you get a lower budget movie, but it obviously does affect the movie. Um... And then also they reuse sets uh, from previous 20th Century Fox productions like Hello Dolly. There's some sets that are like that are made to look rocky and destroyed in a post-apocalyptic setting for the mutants that will later appear in the film. You of course um, have some of the returning members uh, like Dr. Zaius, uh, Zira, but you don't have uh, Rodney McDowell as Cornelius. You actually have a different actor, David Watson, as Cornelius, and it obviously shows he's just not as good as Roddy McDowell. He doesn't do the facial tics as well. I mean, he isn't bad in the movie. I mean, he's far from that. He's all right, but he's not He's not Roddy McDowell, and you can kind of tell. Um, Zayas, in the, the, this time around, he's trying to say, look, uh, we... Uh, he's uh, kind of reluctantly going along with this new character, General Ursus, played by James Gregory. So his guerrilla military guerrilla militaristic type of character and he wants to fight a war uh, it, go on an expedition into the forbidden zone and you know smash whatever's in there and Zayas is kind of against is is reluctant about it Zira is really against it so are all the chimpanzees and they're all 
kind of like protesting it's kind of similar in a similar not very similar fashion but you can kind of connect it to the vietnam protests so that that, that allegory is of course uh, there that's what i like about these movies too is that the allegories are still there even if the quality of the movie isn't as good as the previous installment uh you have the mutants in these movies which are kind of weird and you know they're weird there's it, it's kind of feel it feels a little off in this apes universe but at the same time it lends for some uh, interesting sequences where they mind control some of the characters into doing stupid things also in this film we have uh, the return of Taylor but he's only in the beginning and the end because Heston did not want to do a whole bunch of ape sequels he's like look I'll be in the beginning and the end but you have, must have a way for me not to appear in the rest of the movies and this leads to one of the most badass moments in any movie. Like, I describe this ending to you right now, and I there, there are only a handful of endings that are more badass than this. Charlton Heston blows up the Earth. Let me repeat that. Charlton Heston blows up the Earth. He uses the bomb that the mutant characters worship, and he presses it, and he blows up the Earth. And there are still three more sequels after this. How crazy is that? You know, and you're like, how are they going to do another one? Simple. They use time travel for us to have a third movie. But before I get to the third movie, I'll just say, overall, the second movie's not bad. But it's not great either. In my opinion, other than Battle for the Planet of the Apes, it could be the weakest out of the Apes um, sequels. So I'd say check it out if you really love the first one, and just check it out if you're just trying to watch the entire franchise, but I wouldn't say it's a great movie. Now let's head into Escape. Now how did they get out of, you know, the Earth being blown up? Well, simple. They time traveled. Apparently uh, they u they salvaged Taylor's ship, uh, Zero Cornelius, and a new character, Milo, played by Sal Minio. They basically escape, the Earth blows up, and they time travel back to uh, the 70s, which is the contemporary time, and we get to meet uh, Dr. Hasline, a character who was mentioned in the first movie as to, you know, sending these uh, astronauts into outer space. And this character is played by Eric Braden, who you may remember from Titanic, and he also plays Victor on Young and the Restless. Yes, the blockbuster beach bum just referenced Young and the Restless. I don't think I will ever make that up. Now, what's interesting about this movie is that you have Zero and Cornelius interacting with the humans, but it's kind of reverse of the first film where you have the, you know, human character trying to interact with the ape world, now you have apes interacting with the human world. And this leads for some cute sequences like Zero taking a bubble bath, Zero drinking uh, wine, um, Cornelius in a tux, you know, like a suit. And it's kind of cool, I guess. And the acting, I'd say, is really good. I'm just so glad to see Roddy McDowell back in this role. He is excellent in this movie. You kind of see, like, in the future Apes movies, uh, he'll play Caesar, um, who's uh, Cornelius, Cornelius and Zira's son. And he's kind of very anti, you know, in the sense, not anti-human, but very much like the apes should take over. And he just hates the humans in a certain way because of their cruelty. So, you definitely kind of see uh, some inklings of the Caesar character in Cornelius. But you also kind of see it in Zira too, because she's kind of... She, she's very much like, don't insult me. You know, they kind of insult her in the sense that they, you know, they give her bananas. She doesn't like bananas. Also, when a human touches her, she's kind of like, you know, steps back. She's kind of disgusted uh, in a certain way. You'll, and I, I just want to point out, uh, Sal Minio as Milo is very good, but we don't get enough of him in the movie. Because he's killed by a gorilla. Which is unfortunate. But this movie, the whole crux of this movie is like Dr. Hasline trying to get these apes killed because they reveal that the Earth is destroyed because of a ape human war, ape mutant war, and they reveal that the humans are eventually dissected upon and used as experiments and they become dumb. Hasline does not want this to happen. So he basically is able to get an order to kill Zira, who's now pregnant, and Cornelius. But fortunately, at the end of the movie, uh, they are able to save the child and give them to uh, give the baby to um, Armando, played by Ricardo Montalban, aka Khan from Star Trek, 
and he's also really nice in the film. He's a character who loves animals, and he, he would rather see the world taken over by, chim by compassionate chimpanzees than um, cynical human beings. You know, so, yeah, he's good. And he also appears in Conquest. Now, at this movie, uh, Zira and Cornelius are killed off. It's depressing because you really love their characters in the first two Apes movies, and to see them die is really depressing. And then now we have um, the baby Milo, who will eventually become Caesar, crying out for his mother. This film is not as action-packed as the uh, other Apes installments. However, it does benefit from the strength of the acting from Eric Braden, uh, Rodney McDowell, and Kim Hunter. They're all excellent, and of course I have to mention Sal Mineo is in the film. And the film is, of course, a lower budget, but you don't notice it as much because it's in the modern setting. It's probably a low bu lower budget than even Beneath because they had to use, they didn't use as much ape makeup or, um, you know, the sets. They used, you know, modern contemporary settings. So this might be, uh, might annoy some people, but even though it does have some levels of, you know, cuteness in the movie, I would say that this is a better installment than Beneath and uh, is a really good movie on the strength of the performances of... Uh, of the main actors in the film. This is uh, my thoughts, these are my thoughts on the first three Apes movies, uh, which include Planet of the Apes, Beneath the Planet of the Apes, and Escape from the Planet of the Apes. Next time I will review Conquest of the Planet of the Apes or End Battle of the Planet of the Apes, which I would consider the Caesar saga of the, of the original films. I'll see you guys next time.